Okay. Okay. Let me, let me oh, sure. Go ahead. Good morning, co Banker George. Uh, welcome to the uh, CoStar seminar. And today we have, uh, we're honored to have uh, David Ballou and also Dennis Lee to, uh, uh, you know, to, to teach us on the, uh, what's that, the uh, farming on the listing, right? Yep. The very good information. As you know, the CoStar is the Bible of the commercial real estate. They have uh, lots of uh, good information. So uh, David, take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, so like you said, uh, my name is David Ballou. Um, I've been with CoStar for about two and a half years now. Um, prior to that, I've been working in real estate for about 15 years. Um, started working at a uh, hedge fund buying and selling foreclosed houses over the United States. Um, very interesting work. Uh, got to know, uh, got to interface with lots of city government offices all across the United States, sort of dealing with um, a lot of distressed property. Uh, then when I moved to California, started uh, in uh, property management, uh, both apartments, a little bit of commercial, but mostly apartments, um, and also HOAs, which I will never do again. Um, then got my real estate license, uh, went directly into commercial brokerage, uh, was doing land development and apartment buildings um, in sort of greater Los Angeles. Um, did that for about two and a half years. Uh, then I worked for some real estate attorneys uh, for about a year and a half before COVID. I uh, got into some health and safety receivership work. Uh, which is just a, an obscure little corner of, of real estate law here in California, um, and then came here to work for CoStar. Um, and I was a customer of CoStar uh, before I came to work here. Um, so very, was familiar with the product and was excited at the opportunity to, to be sort of on this side of things um, with CoStar. Um, and then Dennis here is with me. You can tell, you know, tell us a little about yourself. Yeah, so my mom actually worked at Coldwell Banker back in Cupertino about 30 years ago. So totally familiar with uh, Coldwell Banker. Um, so I came from the Bay Area. Uh, basically, um, I did tech work at like Apple and FedEx, and then I moved to LA and I did some commercial real estate. And then I got recruited to work at CoStar. So I have sales experience, account management experience. Uh, so that way we can better help all of you. And yeah, we're going to go ahead and take it off. Yeah. So today we are going to focus on farming for listings because that is probably the most important thing we can do for ourselves. Uh, as real estate agents. Um, so let me get situated here. Let's put that over there. All right. Can everybody see my screen on the Zoom call? Yeah. Okay. So yes. in CoStar, we are going to start on the properties tab. And I'm, I'm going to go over three approaches to finding listing opportunities in CoStar. Um, we're going to start with just sort of a general farm search. Like I want to get a list of all of the properties of a certain type in a certain area, get the owner contact information for those properties. And then I'm either going to call them, I'm gonna send them a letter, I'm gonna to try to meet them in person somewhere, I'm gonna track them down on LinkedIn or other social media, like whatever your approach is. So let's start in Alhambra. And I'm gonna start with multifamily as my property type. Uh, reason for that, uh, number one, there's the most overlap between residential and commercial and multifamily. Um, it's a lot of the same contracts. There's a lot of the same buyers and sellers. Um, clients that you may have, you may know from you know, residential real estate may have interest in commercial transactions. Multifamily is usually where that transition starts to happen. Uh, the other benefit with multifamily here in San Gabriel Valley is there is just a ton of property inventory. Um, I think it's something like 65,000 uh, total inventory units of five unit and up apartment buildings um, here in San Gabriel Valley. So there's just a lot of opportunity uh, to go after listings. And as we'll see, uh, once we get into a breakdown of the ownership here, there's also a lot of mom and pop owners. Um, so there are definitely, you know, large institutional groups who have massive, you know, real estate portfolios here in San Gabriel Valley. But something like 60% of the, the multifamily property inventory in Southern California is mom and pop owned, meaning somebody owns their primary residence and one other uh, uh, income property, usually an apartment building. So there's just lots of fruitful opportunities for, for brokers to go after listings, specifically for multifamily in this area. So once I put in Alhambra and multifamily as my property type here, the top right corner, I, it'll tell me I have 876 uh, these multifamily properties here in Alhambra. So I'm going to filter that down to a minimum of 10 units. That's 265 of them. So that's a nice little list. That's enough properties where I'm giving myself, you know, enough bites at the apple 
but it's not some list of like, you know, 1500 properties that I'm never actually going to work through. So let's start with that 265 properties here. I'm going to go into a property record. All right, so this one is 16 units, uh, 920 North 1st Street, built in 1959, 3.5% uh, vacancy, average rent on the units right now is just a little under 2000 a month. Uh, it's for sale right now, listed at $5.8 million. I've got 10 one-bed units, six two-beds with the average rents there, all the specific building details, number of parking spaces, the construction type, the zoning of the land, demographic information here submarket sales activity, you know, all this important information that you would need to know to sort of assess this property as an opportunity. And also, you know, for this conversation, you're going to try to have with the owner. So go over to the contacts tab now. Now, CoStar is going to track a variety of different contact information. There's a listing on this one. So we want to list the, the broker's information, of course. We're also going to look at recorded owner and true owner. So recorded owner is going to be the name on title. True owner is who CoStar is determined is behind that name, and we'll get contact information for them. Now, the contact information is always time stamped. You know, of course, people can change phone numbers and email addresses. There's not really anything we can do about that. But like on October 27th, 2020, someone from our research department can verify all this information. That verification, especially the phone numbers, is extremely important. You know, there are definitely databases, uh, large databases of phone numbers out there where you will sift through potentially hundreds of phone numbers, you know, to try to contact a single person. The information in CoStar is timestamped and verified. So you know that that number was correct, at least at that point in time. Uh, any questions about this so far? Where does it say timestamp? Right there. Now, this one is already listed with somebody else. So for this farming activity, like I want a listing, I don't want this property. You know, they're already working with somebody else. They've got a listing agreement. You know, we need to move on to the next property. So I'm going to go back to my list and I want to filter out the ones that are already listed for sale. So of these 265 10 unit and up multifamily properties in Alhambra, We've got four of these are currently for sale. So because they're already listed, I, you know, it's I'm not, not for me. Somebody else already beat me to it. I'm going to delete these from the list. And then I'll take out that for sale filter. And now I've got this nice clean list of 261 10 unit and up apartment buildings in Alhambra not currently for sale. Now, there's a couple ways that I could handle this list right now. I could export this to Excel. Basically pick and choose the fields of data that I want on this spreadsheet that I'm gonna work out of. Like let's keep the property address. I don't really care what the property name is necessarily. There is no sale price because we already filtered the for sale ones. Lead certified may or may not be interesting to me. You know, kind of decide for yourself like what you think are the important you know, pieces of information. And then over on the left side, let's get some other fields that are not part of the default set here. So like the owner contact information in particular, like let's get all that true owner info and move that over. Go to multifamily, you know, I'd like the unit mix. I think parking spaces is good. You know, whatever you think is you know, the important fields. Now over here on the right side, I don't want to scroll all the way over to column XG, you know, whatever for like the owner's name, like probably the most important piece of information on this list. So let's get all that, those fields that are important and move those up to the top. Let's do like property address. I like all that owner information there. Let's do number of units. Maybe the unit mix, parking spaces. Again, just sort of organize yourself here. Now, once I've done that, once I've set up my template for the fields that are important for me, let's save that right here. I don't need to run through that set of steps like customizing this spreadsheet every single time. Like if this is my you know, export format for this farming activity, let's be very consistent with that. So we can, you know, all of all the sheets that we might export are gonna look exactly the same. So hit save right there. Let's call this multifamily farming. 
And then you've got it as an option from this drop down right here. You save yourself some time in the future. Now, looking at this right here, just from the true owner column right here, I can tell there are some repeat owners in this list. I don't want to call the same person you know, three times about three different properties. Number one, big waste of time, you know, not very efficient approach. Number two, for that prospect, you're kind of cluing them in that you didn't really do much homework about who they are and what they're doing. And much better to come across credible, you know, having you know demonstrated you've done some research about who they are, you have an understanding, you know, of their real estate holdings and their portfolio. So instead of a list of individual properties here, let's click to owners. All right. Um, can I move this somewhere? Yeah, there we go. So now we got a list of all the owners of these properties. And there's two columns I like to pay attention to on this section. There's the number of properties in search. So we filtered for 261 10 unit apartment buildings in Alhambra that are not currently for sale. If I sort by number of properties in search, I'm identifying who is the most concentrated landlord here. So Pacific Realty out of Montebello, they own seven of these 10 unit up apartment buildings in Alhambra that we've identified. The other column I like to look at is properties owned right here. This is telling us how many properties do they own anywhere in our database. If I sort by that column, it's who's the biggest whale here, like who has the largest portfolio regardless of what we filtered for here. Now, when I'm looking at properties owned here, what I've found in my experience is sometimes it's better to go a little further down into this list. You know, JF Shea Company here, they've got 275, you know, commercial properties in their portfolio. No offense, but they probably have established broker relationships, much harder to get a listing from these guys. They may have very specific investment criteria, like they're plugged in, kind of doing their thing. Sometimes it can be better to go a little further down this list. I'm looking for something like this right here. What does it mean the portfolio square footage? Uh, it's just the square footage of all the buildings in the portfolio. For, because, because we're talking about multifamily, I'm not as focused on the square footage. If we were talking about retail or industrial or office, then yeah, the square footage number would be a lot more relevant. So that one is like so small, the square footage number one property, but it's only 29,000. What, this one right here? Yeah. Probably a bunch of land would be my expectation there. But yeah, that does look a little funny there, that portfolio square footage. That's a little more reasonable for 259 properties. So good observation. Yes. Of all the properties. Correct. So but so you you could take an average by dividing sixteen million by two hundred fifty nine properties yeah. and find the average size of each apartment project. Correct. Now I well I would caution about doing that because this number this two hundred fifty nine is not filtered for multifamily. That's just all commercial property they own. Now this column the properties in search that is subject to these filters we've applied here. So again, like this, this property is owned. This is just a measure of the size of the landlord. It does not necessarily speak to the size of their multifamily portfolio. So that's why these two columns, you kind of use them together. Like you, you want to assess the size of this landlord, but you also want to know like, okay, is this somebody that owns 500 commercial properties, but only one of them is an apartment building? Like maybe that's not, you know, are the best people to approach. Does that make sense? Okay. So what I was saying is I like to go kind of further down the list on that properties owned here. And I'm looking for something like John Rong here. So John lives in Alhambra. So that's good. You know, he's very local here. He has one of these multifamily properties that we've identified that is interesting to us. He owns 18 commercial properties total. That's a fantastic client to have. You know, anybody that owns 18 commercial properties, I definitely want them in my Rolodex, mm -hmm. but they're not so large that it's going to be impossible to get in touch with them or they don't have you know 50 other brokers talking to them all the time so especially for these multifamily properties like go into the second and third page here you know david wang and montebello here four of these apartment buildings in alhambra nine total that's great 
That's fantastic. Click on his name. A little bit of information about who he is, the properties that he owns. On context here, because it's just a name, it's probably just him. You know, if this was a company, we'd list out anybody that we have associated with them. Even for an individual, if like, let's say he has an assistant, you know, that consistently talks to our research department, we'll have them in there as well. Basically, whatever contact information we have available. Anyway, you can find out whether he's a general partner or a partner or, or what kind of percentage ownership they, they have. Um, in CoStar, not necessarily. Um, in this case, like looking at like this specific prospect right here, uh, I would I would tend to think he is the sole owner of these properties. You think so? Yeah, just the size of the portfolio and that it's like his like the the specific name like that. Mm -hmm. Like if it was a company, yeah, then you'd get into like you know distributed shares and things like that. Um, but with the like like let's say our, it's a REIT or something that has the property. There's going to be an LLC, you know, is the name on the title there. And so our true owner information is going to get to like the person you want to talk to in that case. So, so you got to sift through that type of information, you know, based on what we have. Yeah. Yes. Hey, I have a question. So ba basically we're pretty much narrowing down to a specific target in regards to, you know, when you see LLC, and you see all these numbers, you skip through it. When you see a corporation, same thing. But when you see an individual name and when you see the number size, you're pretty much saying, okay, this is kind of like a you know, self-employed owner or something like that with the small amount of units, better opportunity. Correct. Yes, that's that is exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Okay, great. Now, also any of his prior sale and leasing activity right here. Let me make this a little bigger. So like, you know, we're looking at David, we like his property portfolio information. Has he been buying and selling recently? Oops. Where did my thing go? I have a question. Yes. Uh, related to California. Uh, David, can you skip me the little louder for the people who are on Zoom? Because I cannot hear. In California, with our departments, we have uh, rent control throughout the state. We have eviction moratoriums in the state. So if a tenant is not paying rent, he can claim uh, hardship because of COVID-19 and, and stop paying rent. Are you able to identify if any of the apartment projects have non-paying tenants? Non-paying tenants, no. Um, it's my understanding that the COVID restrictions for non-payment have been lifted for, I think, that was in August of last year is that was the end of the, the moratoriums there. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the situation is with with evictions in Los Angeles here, um, right you know post COVID. Uh, when I was a, a property manager, you know standard turnaround time for an eviction in the city of Los Angeles was about eight months. You know that's just like what it was. I would imagine that is much longer now. You know there's quite a bit of backlog. Um, and there's also concern you know later this year about a potential Costa Hawkins repeal. Um, on the ballot, uh, Costa Hawkins is a law here in California that prevents creation of new rent control measures. Um, so the, you know, the state has instituted a, a, a limited rent control measure. Um, City of Los Angeles has rent control. Some some other you know specific municipalities have them as well. If Costa Hawkins were to be repealed, it would you know potentially open the floodgates for fresh rent control measures. I really don't want to speculate about like if that's going to pass or like who would start enacting because you know I don't have a crystal ball of course. My last question is: sure. is because you have um, tremendous research capabilities, do you track regarding apartments if the demand for apartment purchases has declined, remained flat, or is it continuing to increase regardless of the problems in California? Um, we would have data about that, but it would be difficult to say if the transaction volume is being driven by concerns about rent control or just sort of the general interest rate. High interest rates. That's really what I would point more to. Um, so in our sale count database, you know, we track all the commercial transactions. Um, it is my understanding that 2023 was the lowest transaction volume year in our database's history. Mm -hmm. Now that's pretty much entirely attributed to interest rates, not necessarily you know, concerns about rent control. Um, so yeah, it's, it's difficult to say.
I, I, I and per, like personally, just my take on that, like the interest rates are definitely having a, a bigger impact than any concern about potential rent control. Well, this is not the first time there's been an attempt to repeal Costa Hawkins. Oh, I, I do want to uh, praise uh, Costa for the quality of information you provide us realtors. You don't you don't play games. You get you give us good quality information. Well, thank you. Now that is our goal. David, you quoted that um, the turnaround time for UD uh, is uh, eight months. Well, that that was in 2016. So, and then again, like, you know, I, I don't know what that would look like post COVID. Is it for commercial uh, real estate or the residential? No, apartments, apartments. Well, apartments. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's more yeah. Very different than commercial. Yeah, commercial is very different. Yeah. Commercial you can get a pretty speedy uh, resolution, more uh, much much quicker than the um, than the apartments and the residential. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot more regulation about uh, residential leasing uh, here in California than commercial leasing, um, and I that's just sort of the nature of the beast here. One point, one thing to point out, since David brought up that point, what you can also do is like when you do get CoStar, well, we could train you on how to use it. Some um, real estate agents, what they do is they try to target commercial buildings that have high vacancy, meaning that. Make basically the owner of the building might be having trouble collecting rent and stuff like that. So they might be looking to sell. So for example, uh, some of the clients that I work with, I, we show them how to look for uh, buildings that have high vacancy. So in other classes, we can show you how to do that. Any questions about this, this farming approach, just like, you know, identifying an area, picking a property type, drilling down to the owners that you want to contact? What are the about I have a quick question. Like is that you have the sale price of the building, but on the far right side, you have the asking price. So they may have bought it for $4,950, but they have it on the market or they want $5.8 million. So you're, you're giving us the, the correct information as this is your price that they bought it at, and this is what they're asking. So it's that kind of information. As realtors, we need to have that. Absolutely. Um, which what quickly mentioned this, uh, you'll see right on this column. So this is the the history of David Wang's uh, real estate transactions here. If there's not an asking price in the column here, that means it was an off market transaction. Um, so if a property was listed in CoStar or on LoopNet, then we'll tell you what the initial asking price was and then the final sale price and then the difference in the days on market. Um, if there was no listing, then you know all we have is the final sale price. Now. That's a that's a question. So go ahead. Is the one that he sold or he bought? Um, it would be this is both. Whoops. I keep grabbing the wrong. So it'll tell you like true buyer or seller. So it just sort of depends. So all the listings in uh <clears throat> commercial real estate will be in uh Costa? Uh yes. Now there's lots of off market transactions. Like you know, it's very common for someone to sign a listing agreement and not input that listing into any listing service. Mm -hmm. um, the office I worked at actually, it was pretty standard policy to keep it off market for a minimum of 30 days. Uh, we would use that listing to try to get more listings, try, you know, try to double in transactions, you know, these kinds of things. Um, so yes, with the, the listings that are entered publicly, they go into CoStar first, you know, ahead of any other listing service, but there are absolutely availabilities that are not, you know, listed publicly anywhere. So if, if you have a subscription to the CoStar, why do you need any advertisement in the LoopNet? Well, the, explain to the audience? Sure. So the listings in CoStar are only visible to CoStar subscribers. You have to have a CoStar login to see listings in CoStar. Now, if you purchase a LoopNet subscription, then your listing is visible on LoopNet, which is a public website that anybody can go to. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want your listing you know, public to you know, the biggest audience possible, absolutely, it needs to be on LoopNet. Um, sometimes strategically, you don't want a listing you know, pl presented publicly like that. Um, a classic example of that would be, let's say you had a multi-tenant uh, retail property, let's say. You, know, you have seven tenants in the building. Landlord decides that they want to sell the property, he does not want the tenants to know that the building is for sale. You know, that could potentially make, you know, lease ne uh, renegotiations complicated. Just, you know, kind of want to keep it, you know, on the under wraps for, you know, while they're they're negotiating. So that listing would probably stay just in CoStar because any tenant that Googles the property address is going to find the listing if it's on LoopNet. Okay. Thank you. I think we had a question on the Zoom. Um, 
shot. Here we go. What is the difference between number of prop and the property owned? Jeffrey, what, uh, ex explain your question for me. Yeah, what 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 what's the difference between one? That one, see that one number of properties inserts and properties own. Looks like uh, they're different numbers. What's yes. the uh... So the properties in search is the how many of this number of properties that we filtered for. So like I put in Alhambra multifamily minimum 10 units. There's 261 of those total. And like uh, Ratkovich company, for instance, here owns one of those 261 properties. The properties owned column is just every property they own anywhere. Gotcha, gotcha. So this one, this, 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 this one here is just multifamily. Correct, correct. And and, and the rest here are other Anything everywhere. That, anything that thing. Yeah, any, anything now, commercial, commercial. Now, I have now just one, one more question. Can you uh, tell me the anal analytical value of the percentage vacant percentage? If you're looking at this percentage vacant, is there any anal analytical value that in terms of marketing? Sorry, so, so repeat that for me. Look at this uh, percentage, vacant percentage inserts. Uh, these are different uh, uh, percentage vacancy. Is there any analytical value you could use this in the marketing? So you you want to your the question is do you want to use is there a way to use the percentage vacancy in marketing of properties? Correct. Um, interesting question. Um, there are definitely buyers, especially in multifamily, who would prefer the building to be more vacant or completely vacant versus occupied. Um, if you have a, 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 rent, a rent control property with old tenants in the building, the rents are probably going to be significantly below market. And because the property is rent controlled, um, you, you, you can't necessarily remove the tenants. Um, you'd have to do like cash for keys or, or you know, there's there are mechanisms to do that, but it's costly, takes time, et cetera. Um, so in right. some cases, a completely vacant apartment building would be a more attractive buy versus an occupied one. Now, that's not true for all buyers. And if a property is actually fully vacant and available, that's probably something that the, the listing broker is going to put like front and center on the listing. So I wouldn't I wouldn't really rely on this percentage vacancy um, as a search field necessarily, but if you're looking at active listings, that's if it, if the property is vacant, that's going to be something they put front and center. Does that make sense? Got you. Thank you. Got you. Any other questions about that? Okay. So let's look at the change report on this list of properties. So I've got these 261 10 unit and up multifamily properties here in Alhambra. Classic source of listings and residential real estate is calling on expired listings. You go to the MLS, you can pull a report of expired listings, you know, people whose listing agreements expired, you know, fresh opportunity for you. That is not as fruitful in commercial, but if you would like to do that, this changes tab is where you would go. So I'm going to open this up to the last 60 days, let's say, see if there's any changes here. Sorry, can I ask? Yes. The uh, the contact for the owner, is that only phone number or does, is there any other form of contact? I got that. So in uh, David Wang, the one that we went to previously, there's like a little button that had like an email. Um, so you can actually click on that person's name. And then yeah. there's an email. If you click on it, then we can see his email address. So we are able to, in some instances, get email addresses too. Sometimes there's LinkedIn profiles there too. It just sort of depends what we've been able to find. Um, personally, phone numbers and, and mailing addresses are the way to go. Like, those, those are landline or multiple? Depends, whatever we can get. Okay. So the change report here, this is gonna track a, any change to the property, sort of depending on what we put in here. So like this one right here, there was a new property management company was hired on April 24th. These were all new property addresses added to the database. So this is our research department hard at work right here, finding new property addresses. This might be new construction. They might be uh, properties that were under five units before and now they've added units. So now they're like, you know, in our scope of search basically. Space additions, property management change there. So it just sort of depends, you know, what you're looking for here. 
Now I'd like to find a sales status change. So let's go back last 180 days. Let's do a different search then. I'll do Arcadia. And let's do retail this time. All right, so there's 340 of those properties. Go to list, changes. Let's do last 60 days. All right, so here we see a, do a couple of these sales status changes and some space uh, spaces that were listed for lease that were removed. Oh, you're right. Okay. So these sales status change here. This is a, a property that's sold. You know, it was listed at 1.3, sold 1.3. This one went into escrow at 1.6 million here. And you can see a couple weeks later, the transaction closed. So it was sold there. So what I'm looking for is a sales status of withdrawn. <laughs> I swear I had one earlier. Here we go. So this one was listed at 3.199, withdrawn, meaning the listing was expired or they decided to take it off market. It's no longer available for sale. That's a listing opportunity right there. So click on the property, go to the contacts tab, call the owner, send them a letter, whatever your approach is. Any questions about that? Hey, David, what do those stars mean? I see two stars when you went under that one. Uh, that one right there. Oh, yeah. So the stars, that is CoStar's property rating system. Um, It's similar to building class. So like class A would be like equivalent to five star, basically. Um, For it to be five star, it has to be like you know, new construction, architectur architecturally significant, lead certified, like all these different bells and whistles that has to be checked off. Uh, the yeah. vast majority of commercial property here in Southern California, if it's more than, say, five years old, it's going to be two and three star, just like Class B, Class C. Perfect. So, so the listing would have all the contact information of the owner and the agent, maybe, that, 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 that was involved in the transaction, right, uh, David? Yep. So it looks like this was probably who was the previous uh, listing agent. And then, you know, whatever we have for the, the ownership information there. So that's going after expireds. Again, that's not something I typically recommend. It's, it's not as fruitful as residential, but it's also pretty easy to check here. Like you run your property search and just go to the changes tab. It'll tell you pretty quickly, you know, if there's any, any opportunities there. So it's kind of low hanging fruit, you know, pretty easy to do. Owner's information is pretty updated. Um, it's based around you know transactions is our, our easiest way to capture those. Now the benefit here in California is there's a deed that gets recorded. You know anytime a property is sold or even if it moves between you know different entities, mm -hmm. like let's say moving from uh, somebody's name into a trust or an LLC, and so we we get copies of those deeds. That's usually how we collect most of our comp information in CoStar. Um, so we're able to capture those uh, in a much better way here in California than some other states. Um, like Texas, for instance, um, public information about uh, property owner or property ownership information is not public record information. You do not have to put a name on title in Texas. So it's a much, more ch a much bigger challenge for our research department there versus here. Okay, last thing I wanted to show you guys, CMBS loan information. Is anybody here familiar with CMBS? No. Okay. CMBS stands for Commercial Mortgage Backed Security. It is a type of loan that is available to buyers of commercial real estate. The important thing to know about CMBS loans is that the borrower has to report their operating statements to their lender as part of the compliance for the loan. So we get copies of those financial statements for the property. 
So here in CoStar, you click Filters and Loan Active. So now we're looking only at properties attached to these CMBS loans. And I'm going to look for commentary and financials. Commentary means the special, the servicer of the loan has put a note on that property for some reason. That could be a change in occupancy. That could be an upcoming lease expiration. That could be a loan maturity upcoming where the, the servicer is concerned about the, you know, the landlord's ability to pay their new mortgage rate. That could be a code violation at a property. Um, I saw one in here that was a, uh, a you know, the annual sprinkler test that apartments have to do every year. They missed their test. The city sent them a code violation, you know, for missing the, the, the annual sprinkler test. The servicer got a copy of that code violation, put a note in their system saying, hey, here's what's going on. You know, code violation needs to be remedied, so on and so forth. Let's take this one. So when you go to loan, this is the type of information you can get for CMBS loans. So we've got their origination balance, their current balance, their NOI, debt service, the ratio between those two numbers. With that DSCR, debt service coverage ratio, anything below 1.1 is a distressed property. You know, if, it, if, it's a, if it's DSCR below one, then they are paying more in the mortgage than what they are earning, you know, in income on the property. So that's like obviously underwater. 1.1 is usually like a good, you know, rule of thumb to use to find properties that might be interested in offloading. You know, they're not, you know, keeping up with their mortgage, basically. But you, if the DCR is uh, below one, why would the, uh, the lender lend the money? It could be, there's been all kinds of, of you know, change there, especially since COVID. Like, like imagine like an office property. So that's not the one that, that, that the data that when they first look at the loan. No, that's like current. It's just current. Okay. Yeah. But how do they keep the current uh, data uh, uh, every year? It's every This year. is reported as part of compliance with the loans. Oh, for, for every year that they have to mm -hmm. do the app update. And so that's that's why you get the information. And, yep. you know, that's good. Yep. That's, that's good information. You also get an updated tenant list. So the, the, you know, the borrower has to report their, their lease status for all their tenants. So like, it'll tell you right here, top tenants in this property, when their expirations are, square footage that's being occupied. This right here is some of the most difficult data for our research department to get their hands on, like specific tenant information like this. And so that the CMBS loan information, the borrower has to report it to the lender. And so we just have it in the database here. Now, I have a question. Oh, I, yes. I have a question. Excuse me. Can can you start again? That do we start and and the and then and then your 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 score? Can you can you say it again? I I missed that. So so everything since the star rating explanation. Yes, please. Okay. Here we'll go back. All right. So the CMBS loans. It's a data set here in CoStar. We're looking at properties that are attached to CMBS loans. The thing that's interesting about CMBS is that the borrower has to report their operating statements to their lender. So we get copies of those operating statements, as well as a lot of very specific insight to the financial operation of the property, tenants in the building, mortgage rates, these, th these, these kinds of things. So in CoStar, hit filters, loan, active. Now, I specifically want the commentary and the financials properties. Like I want those operating statements and I want to look at the properties that the servicer is paying special attention to. Number one, those might be good listing opportunities. You know, somebody's having an issue with the property. Number two, I get that little, I'm, I get a little note that I'm going to show you here from the servicer with very specific information about the building. So David, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that for every commercial loan that I borrow money from, it appears on this data. data, data Only CMBS loans. CMBS, um, so how do you know that whether your loan is CMBS? Uh, you, uh, mortgage lending is easily my weakest part of, of real estate experience, mm -hmm. but you know, you, you, you have to like seek out specifically to get a CMBS oh, loan. Sure. Um, it's my understanding that I think it's a, um, a lower down payment and a slightly higher interest rate. Um, and there's always a balloon payment attached. Um, some investors love these things. Um, I've got a, a client out in Inland Empire who buys lots of office properties. Mm -hmm. He buys them cash and then refinances them on CMBS almost immediately. That's just sort of his you know, basic procedure. So David, the CMBS is commercial bank securities? 
Commercial mortgage backed security. Yep. So th th these are like a quality control. Quality control. Basically, in terms yeah. of in terms of, of financial, uh, you know, right? Yes, I would agree with that. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so terms of their mortgage here, interest rate, is it fixed, balloon maturity, payment history here. Now, these guys are paying their mortgage, but if they weren't, you can be notified right here. This commentary here, this is what I love about the CMBS properties, though. So it was recently renovated. Underwriting property was 98% occupied, a 1.8 DSCR as of April 8th. 2023 year end DSCR. So it was a 2.2. So they've dropped off in the you know first quarter of 2024 from a 2.2 DSR to a 1.8 with only a little bit of occupancy drop. So that's interesting. You know, something's going on there. That's why the servicer is paying special attention to these properties. That's why that note gets put in there. We have access to that information in CoStar. Loan is added to the servicer watch list as a credit item when a single tenant occupying less than 30% lease expires within the next 12 months. So they've got a creative office that expires this month, and that's why the property is on the watch list. Fantastic information to have. Go to the financials. So here are their annual operating statements for the last three years. All kinds of interesting things we can do with these operating statements. Big problem in commercial real estate is pro forma operating statements. Brokers will put together what's called a pro forma statement, which paints this very rosy picture of the building, what the rents could be. Oh, your property taxes won't be that much. Don't worry about your utility expenses. It's kind of putting a lot of pressure on you as a buyer representative to figure out like what is the actual operating expenses and income for the property. So with these operating statements, we've got line itemed out for every one of these categories, actual NOI. So you can use all, all this information in a number of different ways. Like let's say your client is interested in buying this property. They're a seasoned operator. They're gonna own or operate maybe. They're not gonna hire a you know property management company, let's say. But this operating expense is only available for that CMB. Yeah, just for, just for CMBS loan properties, yeah. But like, so the management fee right here, let's say I'm gonna own or occupy. I don't need a management company. You know, I'm gonna do it myself. I don't need to include that $81,000 in annual expense. So pick and choose, make adjustments, you know, based on your client's expertise and criteria, get down to a more accurate NOI, more accurate cap rate, more accurate property valuation. Any questions about that? So actually, how many percentage, what, what's the percentage of property that are financed by CMBS? Let's see. I think in greater Southern California, there's like five or 6,000 properties attached to these. It's definitely not everything. Yeah, but what's your percentage? So let's say in the map view here, let's just do LA County. All right, so that's 213,000 properties total in LA County. And there's 3,600, 3,700. It's definitely a subset, but again, like, you know, where are you gonna get that kind of insight to these properties? Like all these other properties, it's entirely reliant on you to go collect you yeah. know, information like that. Yes, this is a subset, but you're getting, you know, everything you could possibly want about those properties. And like, here's an example. Let's look for watch list properties, meaning like the, you know, the servicer has is paying some special attention, you know, that list of properties. Let's save that search. If I enable an alert on this search, you can get an email and a notification inside CoStar anytime a new property has been added to the watch list. So jump on top of that opportunity as soon as they arise. Hey, David, I have a question. Sure. Je Jeffrey, can you uh, just, uh, can you simplify one, just one simplify? Let's say uh, in Arcadia, G give me a watch list.
You got one. Extended stay America. It's one. The hotel. Mm hmm. It's part of a huge portfolio. Where's the commentary? Uh, because it's uh tied up in this portfolio, we we we'd have to go to like the 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 total page. Where's the? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turn up this one. It's usually a one click right there. Right there. Mm -hmm. Hmm, no, there's a link right here. Yeah, hmm. there should have a commentary on that on the finance. No, that's what I'm, I'm saying. There normally is a link for like this entire portfolio because the commentary is going to be tied to like you know this total four billion dollar note right here. And I'm not sure if my like Zoom is messed up or something because it's usually like right here. Yeah, how about the operation operating expenses? Yeah, there you go. There you go. You got the last two years right there. Mm hmm So yeah, that's the CMBS stuff. It is definitely a subset of properties, but very specific insight for those properties. And especially with a, a saved search with an alert, you can kind of stay on top of those opportunities as they arise. Any questions about that? Well, for the people who, who are just new to the commercial real estate, mm -hmm. what is the first step in the uh, farming effort? That first thing, the first set of steps I showed you. Okay, that's 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 the entry level. Yeah, pick an area, pick a property type, set up filters based on whatever approach you think it's going to be, like size of property, recent sale dates, whatever your you know approach is there. I would suggest a list somewhere between, I don't know, 500 and 1,000 properties, something like that, and start making phone calls, send letters, get in front of people. So how do you keep track of it? How, how, do, you, how do you maintain the, 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 <clears throat> you know, the momentum of, of farming? Maintain the suggest, momentum? What do you suggest to those people make lots of phone calls mm -hmm. if you don't yeah you got you got to make phone calls e emails are a joke how, how everyone in this room how many emails do you think you receive every day how many, how many of them do you open Hundred, hundreds only 10 <laughs> i think i think i have like fifteen thousand emails in my gmail I just, they just sit there i don't look at them mm -hmm. why if i if somebody, you, somebody you're approaching somebody you know, for a potential six-figure commission, probably a multi-million dollar decision they're going to have. What? How is an email going to, how are you going to differentiate yourself with an email? Make phone calls, People send letters. It's difficult. People don't, 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 don't want to uh, talk to you on the phone. No, there's no substitute. <laughs> Basically, David, the more effective way of contacting them is through... Uh, Phone calls, letters, and stuff like that, not emails. Exactly. Yeah, you, like you get a plethora of emails. Like if you if you already met somebody and you're, you know, you've established some rapport and like they're responding to your emails, then yeah, sure, that's fine. But like initial outreach, no way. So how often does subscription with this uh, bookstore? It's like do we have to do like a whole year or can we do like a month? Year. Month? Minimum year. Minimum year. Maybe yeah. they can give uh, you know the audience uh Something about the uh, subscription and codes. Uh, what's the difference between an uh, individual membership and a corporate membership? Kind of explain mm -hmm. that. And then uh, we have we have uh, open open uh, enrollment period too. Yeah. So the for for Cobra Banker George. So can you talk to the audience about that? Sure. So uh, Cobra Banker George here has a group rate for CoStar access. You're eligible for a pretty significant discount on the monthly price. Um, let's say you were just an independent agent out there wanting to do commercial real estate. CoStar is $495 a month on a, on a minimum one-year contract. So we don't offer any kind of like one-month trial or quarterly access or anything like that. Minimum one year, $495 a month. 
Um, I think right now with the number of seats we have, we're at 360 something, 380, 380 excuse me, $380 a month. Um, so what, 20% off basically on the monthly expense there. So a pretty nice discount. And the benefit there is the more people that are added to the contract, the per person cost comes down. So that 380 number is based on the current setup. Um, if you are interested in getting set up with access for this, that could be less sort of depending on the number of people we have. Now included in that subscription cost is free and unlimited training. So me and Dennis have come out here, you know, we do these, these group sessions like this. If you sign up for CoStar, I wanna meet with you one-on-one -on -one so we can get into very specifically what you're working on, what you wanna do, what's important to you. You are also eligible for a discount on LoopNet advertising as a CoStar subscriber. So hopefully you're gonna plug, you know, do everything that I just showed you today, start generating some listings for yourselves. And those clients are going to want their listings visible to everyone on the internet. So we're going to get those put up on LoopNet. You get a little bit of a price break as a CoStar subscriber. Yes. So today we're representing a client that wants to buy a property in California. He says, you know something? And I'm going to be buying a, a 30 unit, oh, I want to consider a 30 unit apartment here in California, principally the San Diego Valley. But I want to see if what the difference is that on the same 30 units, if it's in Arizona, Texas, and Georgia, we can use CoStar to access those states, right? And Correct. States. Yeah, you have nationwide access in CoStar. I'm also in, in Canada as well. Um, so yeah, you're not restricted to just Southern California, um, especially in commercial real estate. There are lots of investors here in California who do not buy real estate here. You know, they want to look in Texas or Tennessee or anything like that. Um, you would probably need to figure out, you know, a, a, a brokerage option for that. I'm not exactly sure what, you know, Coldwood Banker offers there, but you can absolutely source deals for your clients out of state through CoStar. Now you mentioned before, like Texas, they don't allow the owner's name. Mm -hmm. They don't require the owner's name. So I assume like there's no contact info also for these people out of state? Oh, no, we have some contact info. It's just, it's much more difficult for us to capture there. Oh. It doesn't mean that we don't have contact info. Like we definitely still have contact info in Texas. We just have more contact information here in California. Hey, David, I have, uh, David, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the uh, the the price with the, with a twenty percent discount, you know, is three three eighty something like that. It's still quite steep for us starting starting a, a, a you know real estate agent going into commercial. I wonder if you if you can if you have some program whereby you could try three months you know or or less than six months. Nope, minimum one year. And like about the cost of it, it's this is extremely valuable information. Your clients are standing to make hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars. Um, not to be like, it's it's this is valuable information. You mentioned that the. Cost of the down by the amount of subscribers in the office, right? Mm -hmm. So, in, I do not know what number you have in our office right now, but maybe we can break it down to us like, hey guys, if you have 10 people joining in, joining in this subs subscription right now, mm -hmm. it can significantly drop it another $100 or something like that. That would be easier for us to maybe like, you know, okay, let's who wants it and then we can sign up together. Yeah, I mean, because if you just go like one by one by one and like we still 380, we do not know when is it gonna go it's gonna go down. I think Maybe real the, the but, is gonna yeah. be very <laughs> Yeah, like price is definitely a factor in your decision making process. I think the most important thing is even if you signed up, you know, five or ten more people, it's not gonna drop the price significant for you. What you need to think for yourself is am I serious about commercial real estate? Is this something I pursue? Because if you're looking at like 50 bucks or 100 bucks, um, maybe CoStar might not be the right fit for you. You just have to look at, is this something, is commercial what I want to do? Is this something I want to pursue? I guess like, again, like you, you're going to like, imagine yourself in a listing appointment. You're talking to somebody about a $5 million commercial property. You're going to be asking them for what, $80,000 commission. And we're haggling over like, you know, a couple hundred dollars for access to all the information you need to facilitate those transactions. If that's where you're at, then yeah, I, I think CoStar might not be for you. Or well, if that's the alternative is that you can you can team up with a mentor that who has a CoStar uh, uh, subscription and work with them. 
Yeah, but if you've got you a not really have, you really cannot afford the the, the, the subscription fee itself for that. Uh, so the, I mean, level, you know? the the licenses work like your MLS access. Like you you can't really share the login and like reports that you would generate out of here are going to have the other agent's name on it, not yours. So like if you're brand new and like it's like your first you new know, listing opportunity, I would strongly recommend you pair with a, a senior agent. Just make sure you get through escrow. Like that's the most important thing there. But like if you start if you're serious about this and you want to do deals, you need your own license. So Peter asked a very important question. Like if you were new to commercial real estate, what would you do? Like what I would probably recommend is I would work with a senior bro senior real estate agent that has done commercial um, transactions before. If I were starting out, I wouldn't mind splitting 50% of my transactions with them or 50% or of my commissions with them. And the reason why is because they're going to be able to have the experience necessary in order to make the right decisions because they're going to be asked the clients going to be asking you a lot of questions that you may not be able to answer mm -hmm. what other things that i would probably recommend is maybe doing like a coaching service they have coaching services that uh, specialize in commercial real estate also what i would re recommend is what david was saying is just making a lot of different calls every single day like if you work at marcus and millichap and uh, cbre they require you when you first start to make about 50 to 100 calls a day um, because that's going to be how you're going to be able to prospect and get um, commercial people to talk with you and be able to get listings. When I was prospecting as a broker, I did not count a uh, number of outbound dials. It was how many like landed calls, like how many people actually answered and like had a conversation with. And I wanted a minimum of 35 conversations a day. So I, I don't know how many phone calls I made. It was a lot. We we were at the office calling until probably 9 p.m. most days. How many land calls you made? 35 was my standard. That's still very good. It's a lot. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah. One of the yeah, and one of the advantages that you do have though, um, is you do work with a lot of residential um buyers and sellers, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what happens is they might end up having commercial buildings that they also own, right? So that is also a good opportunity for you to kind of get co-star in order to help those clients out. So like imagine you doing residential, you don't have the MOS. It's almost like impossible to get the house sold without the data necessary, right? So same with commercial, like when you're helping a client, you need that um, data in order to help that prospect out. Yes. When, when I'm doing a search for properties for my client and I want to see the commissions being offered by the other side broker, does your database show the, the commissions? Nope. CoStar has never displayed uh, commission information in our database. And with the NAR settlement, the MLS is going to be, you know, behaving that way as well. Um, that dilemma that the NAR settlement has you know, pre presented agents of how am I going to get paid on the buy side or tenant side? That is a part of every commercial transaction in the history of the earth. You as the buyer or tenant representative have to work that out with the listing agent. Some people are fair, split things evenly. Some people are not. Like there's wide range of outcomes there. That is a big part of being involved in commercial is having the confidence you know, to, to ask for you know, what you deserve for your services. Okay, next, uh, okay, let me go to a different question. Let's say that I want to see all the listings that are in CoStar of all the listings of, within Coldwell Bank and Commercial Brokers Realty. How do I go about seeing all the listings determined and in house? So what I'll do is we're kind of, we're over on time. David, what I can do is since you're a CoStar subscriber, I could, after this training, go over how to do that. Basically, we have a new directory within CoStar. We can see all the transactions that George Realty has ever done. Um, and then we can also see the listings too that George Realty has. Okay. So we can do that. So it's possible. To yes. Yeah. It's yes. It's not available if you're not a subscriber. Correct. Yes. And there's one last question. What kind of office support training will I have all year? So basically to answer that question, um, David and I can come to your office. We can train you on CoStar. There's also um, training classes that are that you can take um, in CoStar. 
They're like two to 10 minute videos. And then there's also every single day we have uh, trainings available where you can learn about prospecting, underwriting, um, and things like that. And so that concludes our training today. And thank you so much. Really appreciate I it. I have one last question. Yeah. Sure. Let's say that I am doing a survey and I go on Zoom and share my screen with my clients so they can see the the the, the database I'm working with. Or is that private? No, you could do that. Um, you know, Zoom and CoStar famously do not get along very well. It's just a lot of bandwidth going on, but yeah, you can do that. Cool. Okay, that's my last question. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, David. Where's the stop recording? Stop, stop thank it. you, David.